Well, Friday morning, I got the phone call that we all fear. At this time of quarantines and chaos with outbreaks, my phone rang, and it was the call that we all fear. My parents were on the other end of the line, and they said, son, we need your help. We're trying to set up some new technology, and we need your help to help us set up our Rokus. Now, understand Understand that this is the same set of people whom I love dearly, and yes, who brought me into the world. But the first time they got an iPad, it was a three-day ordeal because not only could they not remember their password, they couldn't remember the answers to their own security questions. So we had to call the Apple support number and actually prove that they are who they said they were in order for Apple to work with them and reset everything just to get an iPad set up. And so the prospects of me helping Helping them set up five new Rokus on FaceTime was not exactly how I wanted to spend my Friday. But nevertheless, what else do I have to do? Because we're all quarantined. So I said, sure, that's fine. So my dad opens up the package and he gets it out and he starts asking me what the different parts are. And so I explained to him one end of the Roku you'll plug into the HDMI port and the other end of the Roku needs to be plugged in either to the USB port on the back of the TV or into the wall. And he just looked at me like he didn't understand at all what I had to say. And then my seven-year-old son came and sat in my lap and said, I'll be here, Dad, in case Baba, which is what he calls my dad, asks any more dumb questions out of the mouth of my seven-year-old. He's sitting there mocking his grandfather because my seven-year-old could have figured out how to plug in the Roku and get it going, but his grandfather could not figure this out. Well, he finally goes behind his television and he plugs in the one end of the Roku and he, he comes back and he declares victoriously, I've got it plugged in, we've got it set up. And before I let him go, contrary to my better judgment, I said, well, Turn on the TV and let's make sure everything's working. I shouldn't have said it. It's my fault. But sure enough, the words escape my mouth. And I wish I could have grabbed them and shoved them back in, but that's not how life works. And so he turned on his TV and he got nothing but a black screen. And he said, well, it's not working. And then my seven-year-old said, did you plug in the other end? And then he said, what do you mean? And then we had to explain to him how it was like charging a phone. And the whole process took a little under an hour and a half to do what should take three minutes to plug in a brand new Roku. Now, some of you are there because you have parents or grandparents who ask you all kinds of technology questions and you can relate. Some of you are on the other end. And you, have, you look at new technology and you're like, we have no idea what to do with this, but at least we can sew on a button when it falls off a shirt and we don't have to throw it away and buy a whole new shirt, right? So we all have different things that we're good at, and that's great. That's great. Uh, sometimes they can lead to a lot of tension, but, but when done correctly, all the differences and all the different things that we're good at should serve to enhance us as a community. And that's exactly what goes on in the church. And so this morning, we're going to talk about a concept that's a little foreign and a little different to a lot of people the first time that they hear it. And yet, it's this idea that God actually gives each of us who follow him gifts and abilities. Now, I, I know that some people scratch their heads because historically they're called spiritual gifts. And so there's this whole realm of mystery and there's this whole lack of understanding. And people are like, what's that concept all about? It, it's brand new and people don't really understand it. But this morning we're going to see how God in his infinite wisdom has made it so that we're all good at different things. And how that should serve not to divide us, but rather to unify us and to make us the best that we can possibly be so that we really are better together. So if you have your phones or your tablets and you're not watching the stream on them, then take them out and, and go into the Bible app. And if you're watching the stream, no worries. The verses will, will uh, shoot up right on your screen. But we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 12 this morning. We're going to dive into verse 1 where we read these words. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans... You were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now again, let's just 
pull this apart a little bit and understand what's going on here. Concerning spiritual gifts, the whole reason that the Apostle Paul had to write to the church in Corinth to talk to them about this is because it was a concept that people were unfamiliar with. It's not something that people just naturally understand. And there's a lot of mystery and, and some just a lot of different thoughts surrounding this idea. But at the basic point, what we all need to know, what we can all agree on, is this, that God gives people who make the decision to follow him, he gives them gifts. He gives them gifts. And they're to be utilized, they're to be utilized for his glory. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And so he says, he says right off the bat, understand that you have a gift. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have a gift. God loves you. He cares about you. So he has equipped you with something that will help you serve him. It is for his glory. And then he goes on to this, this seemingly unrelated conversation, and yet it's very related. And he talks about this idea that nobody can say that nobody can say that Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit, and nobody can say that Jesus is accursed apart from God. And we might scratch our heads and be like, what in the world he's talking about? And to help you understand this, I want to take you back to a simpler time. If we could all just do a little bit of time travel. Go back in time with me to December of 2019. Nobody had heard of coronavirus. Nobody had ever thought we'd be self-quarantined. Everything was going, for the most part, great in the world. And the biggest worry on a lot of people's minds was whether or not Kanye was really a follower of Jesus. We had nothing else to worry about other than whether or not Kanye really followed Jesus. And so you, you, you can recall, maybe you even posted on social media about it. Maybe you were really concerned about it. But people, people were on different sides of the aisle or, no, Kanye's made the decision to follow Jesus. Other people were like, this is all a publicity stunt. And what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 12 is, is none of that matters. None of that matters. Listen, if anybody, if anybody communicates the truth about Jesus, that is because that's from God. It doesn't necessarily mean that the person who communicates that truth about Jesus is ultimately a follower of God. He says, but that's not the point. The point is the truth has still been proclaimed and understand that that's impossible to happen apart from God. And similarly, on the other side, it's impossible on the flip side to, for people to levy about false claims about Jesus and, and have it that any part of that related to God. And then he continues... He continues in verse 4, but, but just, just pause real quick and just, just know that we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about it. Let God worry about all those decisions. It's, it's not our job to worry about who's legitimately made a decision to follow Jesus, who hasn't. We're, God doesn't need us to police his kingdom. He doesn't need us to, do, to stand at the door and to check the IDs. If somebody proclaims that they're a follower of Jesus, let's listen. And if there's truth revealed, that truth is coming from God, and we'll just celebrate that truth. And if not, then we understand ultimately where that truth comes from. And so anytime that truth is going to be revealed, God's going to use different means and different messengers in order to do that. And oftentimes, he's going to use gifts that he gives us. So we're going to shoot along in verse 4 here where we read these words. Now, there are varieties of gifts but the same spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Again, our gifts are all different. They're all different, but they're all needed. Our gifts are all different, but they're all needed. Our gifts do not look the same. Our gifts, our gifts have a wide variety, and the reason for that is because that wide variety is needed to come together collectively in concert with each other to advance the kingdom of God. The church is a collective community. That's what the church is. It's not a group of, of individuals who try to all mirror and mimic one individual. That's a very dangerous thing. The church is a collective community, and we best impact each other and we best impact our world when we understand that there is diversity within that collective community and each of us within the collective community are wired differently and so we are going to use however God's wired us for his glory not looking and saying oh well I want to be wired that way and we're going to talk about that and if you feel that way you're not alone but understand there is a wide diversity of gifts and they're all needed every single one is needed to come about to bring about the most impact that the collective community of the church can have and the most impact that we can have on our world for the glory of God. For to one, verse 8 says, is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. 
And to another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one in the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. There is diversity of gifts, but the point is to use them collectively for something greater. I, I want you to do this. Think of your favorite song. Think of your favorite song. Okay, now that we've all thought about living on a prayer by Bon Jovi, think of your other favorite song. It'd be a little bit boring since we all picked the same song, but think of your other favorite song. Now, think of how many parts are on that song. Chances are your favorite song is not just somebody strumming an acoustic guitar. Chances are your favorite song is not somebody just singing acoustically without any instrumentation. Chances are your favorite song isn't somebody just playing the piano. All of those instruments, all of those resources, all of those things come together and are all needed. So it is with the gifts that God has given us. Our gifts are different. We're, we're good at different things. We have voids in different areas of our lives. I'm not good at some things. I'm, I'm good at some other things. So the same is true for all of us. All of us have those areas that we excel at, and others of us have those areas that we're just terrible at, and we should never, ever do. And the beauty is God wired us, and he designed us that way, that we need each other to come alongside together and to be used best when we work together for his glory. And then he continues in verse 12 when he says these words, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. He says there are a lot of parts of your body. There are a lot of your parts of your body, but it has to work together. When the parts of your body don't work together, you're in trouble. This is what many people who suffer a stroke are, are in therapy for a really long time, sometimes for the rest of their lives as a result of, because part of their body shuts down and doesn't act in unison with the rest of their body. And so he draws the parallel of the human body. He says, just as your body is made of many members and many different parts, so it is with the church. That we're made up of many different members and many different parts, but we have to work together. So go back to your favorite song. Go back to your favorite song. And here's the question. How long did that band stay together? How long did that band stay together? Have you ever noticed the, traje the trajectory of most huge bands? They get famous, they're stuck around each other for a really long time, and then they fall apart. They fall apart. How many great songs have, how many great songs haven't been written because bands can't figure this out? How many great songs haven't been written because the lead singer wants just a little bit more time in the spotlight? How many great songs haven't been written because the lead guitarist says, I want to go off and do my own thing. I don't want to be a part of the collective anymore. How many great songs haven't been written because the drummer's like, I want to play loud on every song and we need to have drum solos like it's 1988. How many great songs haven't been written because the bass player's like, I just want to be named in the band. That's all. I just want somebody to know that I'm actually here. How many great songs haven't been written because bands can't figure this out? And how many great things for God's glory haven't been accomplished because churches can't figure this out? How many great things haven't been accomplished because people can't or won't come together collectively and be excited about the way that God has wired them. And to find their niche and to find their role and serve in that role well. And realize that it's not about them. It's not about their name. It's not about their kingdom. It's about the kingdom of God. I just wonder, how many great songs has the world missed out on as a result of bands not figuring this out? And even more tragically, how many great moments and movements of God has the world missed? 
not seen to the full capacity because of this. Now, make no mistake. If God wants to accomplish something, he's going to accomplish it, whether or not you personally or your church personally is involved. But the thing you're going to miss out on is not God working in the world. The thing you're going to miss out on is the blessing of being a part of it. Because we have to work together. And the first step to working together is understanding that we all have gifts. Our gifts are different. We celebrate that diversity and we realize that we're better together and we need to function as one. He continues, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand and you do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts yet one body. I know that this can be a challenge for all of us because there's something about human nature that we all desire something else. We all desire something else. And so this can, this can be a challenge for all of us, but what we really have to try to do is we really have to try to embrace the way that God has wired us. We have to embrace the way that God has gifted us and understand that the talents and the abilities that we possess and the spiritual gifting that we have is a direct gift from God, that God wired us this way, that he gave us these things. And God is a good God. He's a good father who's given us a gift, and he wants us to use that gift for his glory, not to sit there and say, oh, but I wish I had another gift. You ever known somebody who on their 16th birthday got a car? Have you ever known any of them who looked at their parents and said, well, it's all right, but it should have been a Lexus? Maybe you know that person, and their parents should have taken away their car if you do know that person. But the challenge for us is not to look at God and say, well, I wish you would have made me different. I wish I had what that person has, or I wish I had the ability that that person has. Look at how that gift is. Look at, look at all the great things they get to do with that gift, and yet you've given me this gift. What? No, 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 no. Understand that God has given you a gift. He's done it on purpose, just for you. In the way that you're wired, in the way that he's molded you, he has given you a gift. Embrace that. Embrace the way that God has made you. Quit looking out and saying, oh, but if only I were this person or if only my gift was like that. No, 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 no. Embrace it. Embrace who you are. Embrace the gift that God has given you. Have you ever known someone who struggles being content with what they're good at? The greatest basketball player in my lifetime was Michael Jordan. And for nearly two years in his prime, he left the game of basketball. And I understand there were other factors in his life, but he left the game of basketball and he went to play baseball. And the man could not hit a curveball to save his life. The world's best basketball player in my lifetime, in the middle of his prime, took off almost two full seasons to go play minor league baseball where he couldn't hit a curveball. If Michael Jordan can suffer from this, you can too. Now, in the case of Michael Jordan, after nearly two full seasons away, he came back. And on that side of his career, he won three more titles. But I wonder, how many people has God equipped to just excel at something? But rather than embrace that, look out and see all the other things that other people do well. And say, rather than find contentment in the way that God has made me, I'm going to go chase that. That's the thing I want. 
That's what I'm going to go run after. And how many people never circle around after an attempt, never circle around to land back in their sweet spot in the way that God has made them and instead chase a baseball career without the ability to hit a curveball? Embrace who you are. Embrace the way that God has made you. He didn't make a mistake. It wasn't an accident. He's given you the gifts and the abilities and the talents you have for a reason. Embrace it. Own it. And serve him. He continues in verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary. The parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. When's the last time you thought about your little toe? I'll tell you exactly when it is, when you kick the register or the wall. That's the last time you thought about your little toe. You pay no attention to your little toe. You don't even think about it. You don't even think about the fact that it's there until you kick a wall or a register. And then you are trying to come up with every Christian curse word you can find if your kids are around. And you're just letting those fly instead of what you really want to say. Because there is a pain like none other when you just hit that sucker against the wall or the register. Other times we don't, we don't even think about it. We don't even think about it. But it's, it's there. And it's part of the body. Everyone plays a part. Every single person plays a part. Now, sometimes those roles are more visible. Sometimes those roles are, are done with, with more of an audience. Not for, not for the elevation of any one individual, but it's just the way that things are wired. It's just the way that, that the church meets. So sometimes people have a more visible role, but it doesn't mean that they're any more important or that their gift is any more important. It doesn't mean that at all. He says, every single part of the body, no matter how small you may feel, no matter how insignificant you may think you are, no, no, no. He says, no matter what, you are part of the body. And you're needed as part of the body. The church needs you. It needs your gifts. It needs your abilities. And we've seen this on full display in our world over the course of the last week, haven't we? That I find it fascinating in response to the coronavirus. The things that are keeping us going are not the overpaid airline CEOs and executives, not politicians, not airlines or athletes or, or actors. The things that are keeping us going right now is a society are grocers and pharmacists, our truck drivers, our delivery men and women, our community small businesses, all people that in the normal scheme of things would be overlooked, that wouldn't have any part of the spotlight. And yet when our country shuts down and when everyone is stuck in their house, who are the people that are keeping us afloat? people that are normally forgotten, the people that are normally glossed over, the people who are normally paid no attention. Every single person in every single gift matters. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. 
And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating in various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. If the virus has taught us anything, it's that we really do need each other. It's that we need each other. Embrace how God's made you. Embrace how God has wired you. Own it. Understand that God doesn't make mistakes. He's wired you the way that he's wired you with the talents, the abilities, and the spiritual gifts that he has given you for a purpose. Stop comparing yourself. Stop comparing what you have done with what somebody else has done in another context. Stop being jealous because they have done something different than you have done or because their platform seems bigger than your platform. It's never about that in God's economy. So don't lose sight of that fact. Embrace what you're good at. Embrace that God gave it to you. And he didn't make a mistake. And use it. Use it for his glory. Use it for his kingdom. Use it for one another. When I grew up, one of the shows that I watched was Mr. Rogers. And undoubtedly, you've seen this going around with some of the other great memes that are going around on social media. This one's a little more serious than some of my favorite memes that are going around on social media right now. But there's a meme of Mr. Rogers, and there's a quote that's been widely attributed to him, and he said on many occasions, and so it takes on a, a little variance here and there, but essentially the, the quote is this that, that is broadcast on the memes. When I was a boy, and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Followers of Jesus, this is our call. Not just during the coronavirus, not just during times of pandemic and disaster and crisis. All those times rally us together as they should and collectively we move and we're generous and we serve people and we're, we're passionate about it. And it is Christians who go on to planes more proportionately than any other sect of the of of the population to go serve areas that are wiped out with disaster and wiped out when affliction comes. It is Christians who are the most generous people proportionately. It is Christians who do a really good job of responding in times of crisis as we should, carrying the name of Jesus because ultimately he is the only hope. And let's make sure that we continue to do that now during this time of a health pandemic, that we are the first responders, that we are there to serve, that we are there to support anybody we can, that we are there to show love and hope and peace, that we are willing to go outside of our comfort zones for the glory of God, that Jesus' name would be glorified and it would be magnified in the midst of crisis. But let's not lose sight of something at the same time. That our call to be helpers is not merely when crisis occurs. Our call to be helpers is not merely sounded in times of pandemic or when earthquakes or hurricanes or tornadoes strike. Our call to be helpers is constant. That we are to model the way of life of Jesus. That we are to serve. We don't have to do that on our own. But we can do that 
under the power of God with the gifts, the talents, and the abilities that he's given to us. Whatever it might be, however God has gifted you and however God has wired you with talents and abilities, embrace that. Embrace who you are. Embrace how God has made you. And live it out. Serve people. Serve each other as part of the church. Serve the world. Show the people that you work with, the people that you live next to, show the people in your own family just how great our God is. By using the gift that God has given you. Embrace it. Stop wishing that you were someone else. Stop wishing you had something else. Rest in who God made you to be. Be a helper. And serve. The best of your ability. Every day of your life. God, I pray that we would be people who work together. And that starts with us individually, understanding and embracing how you've wired us, and who you've made us to be. I pray, God, that we would continue to just just work together well. And that starts with each of us just just making a decision that says, I'm not going to find my significance in, in what I accomplish, in the accomplishments that I see that other people could point to. I'm not going to find my significance in how big my platform is. I'm going to find my significance in who God has made me to be. And so, God, once we really own that and embrace that, help us come alongside each other and realize the beauty of the diversity of ways that you've gifted us within this collective community of the church is best on display when every person does their part. God, help us be the helpers. Help us be your servants. And help us proudly declare the name of Jesus. Let it be magnified. And in the midst of uncertainty and crisis, may one thing be certain. That we point people to a God who doesn't change to a God who is not caught by surprise and a God who is greater. Use us, we ask, in your son Jesus' name we pray.